Okay, go ahead. Well, let's begin with the word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day today. We thank you that you've given us fathers. We thank you that you've given us your son, Jesus Christ, and that you've given us the freedom to be here, to be able to worship you, and to be able to learn all about you through your holy word. We pray that your Holy Spirit be upon us this day as we learn about Jeremiah, as we learn of Jeremiah and the troubles that he has in proclaiming that word to people who are unwilling to hear that word. We pray that you would open our ears. And even though we too may be like Jeremiah, people don't want to hear about you. But we still give you praise and thanks for all that you do and that you keep us until that day that you bring us home to be with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, um, I thought we'd look at our Old Testament lesson today. It's Jeremiah chapter 20, starting at verse 7. Uh, just to give you an idea of who Jeremiah is, Jeremiah is, is one of the later prophets. Um, and he's been called to preach, to, to bear witness against the people in the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Um, as you may recall, centuries before this, under Solomon's son, the kingdom of Israel was torn apart with the northern ten tribes being called Israel and the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin being called Judah. And in Jeremiah's day, God has already made judgment and has sent the Assyrians in to capture Israel, the northern ten tribes, they have been captured. They have gone into exile up into Assyria, the Syrians, and, and they've been spread out. And so they're under that captivity. Jerusalem being the center where the temple is. In Jeremiah's day, God is bringing judgment to his people because they refuse to change their ways. They refuse to change their ways in that they believe that just because they go to temple or just because we go to church, that that automatically gives us a pass, that gives his people a pass, that they can go ahead and do what they please after they leave church or leave temple. Uh, especially in those days, they would go out and they would worship the Baal gods. These were pagan idols that were set up, and they had different gods for different things, for fertility, for rain, for good harvest and whatnot. And the people would practice this, and God's judgment had finally come upon the people. And Jeremiah is the one who is proclaiming that the time is near, that the time is coming when the people are going into exile. And Jeremiah is being God's servant. He would expect that because he's God's servant, that the people are going to listen to him. But instead, the king didn't like the message. And so he would bring in his own prophets, and they were false prophets. And so the false prophets would be against Jeremiah. And the way that Jeremiah was treated, he was mistreated, he was beaten, he was abused, he was thrown into jail. Um, in fact, he was just, earlier in chapter 20, he speaks of being persecuted by Peshur. Peshur was a priest in the temple. And the, and the prophet, he's telling Jeremiah to stop prophesying that they're going to go into exile, that they're, they're not going to go into exile, that they're going to remain there. And so... Jeremiah is released, he's beat, and Jeremiah, he, he now rebukes Pasher up in verse 3, where he says that the Lord does not call your name Pasher, but terror on every side. For thus says the Lord, behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. They shall fall by the sword of their enemies while you look back on. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. He shall carry them captive to Babylon, 
and shall strike them down with the sword. Moreover, I will give all the wealth of the city, all its gains, all its prized belongings, and all the treasures of the king of Judah into the hands of the enemies, who shall plunder them and seize them and carry them into Babylon. And you, Peshur, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. To Babylon you shall go, and there you shall die. And there you shall be buried, you and all your friends to whom you prophesied falsely. And so for prophet, these are, these are tough words to, to tell somebody who's a priest in the temple that the ways that you're, that you're following, the things that you're doing, the things that you're saying are not of God, that you're mistreating God's very servants. And so Jeremiah now turns to God in verse 7. And verse 7 begins our, our Old Testament reading, our First Testament reading for this day. And Jeremiah says, O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him. Say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived that we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal desire will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. Cursed be the day of which I was born, the day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father, a son is born to you, making him glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon, because he did not kill me in the womb. <coughs> Excuse me. So my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out of the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? And so, <coughs> excuse me, we, we hear Jeremiah's plea. And I think we as Christians, sometimes we feel like we're all alone, that we're the only ones who have that message, that, that we're all by ourselves. We're like this island. And perhaps you feel that way as well. We wonder where, where the Lord is. Why do we see all this destruction going on? <coughs> Excuse me. Any any initial thought? Do, do we do we have two way communications here? Uh, yeah. Let's see. Um, you know what? We do not have the speakers on. Oh. Here, I'll unmute here. Okay. So, 
So yeah, I think we, we're not going to get much. We're not going to get much uh, communication from other people. Oh, okay. Because we turned off the speakers. Are you guys on again? Yeah. Yeah, we're on again. Live? Yeah, we're live. Yeah. Edgar Bill. Yes. Thank you so much for the sermon. You're welcome, Tim. It was great. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for all Thank the things God. you do here. And uh, I hope to see you all, well, some of us, next Sunday. Yeah. Yes. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Peter. Yeah, thanks. And, uh, God bless you, too. No, I'm going to go home. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My wife is at home watching her church service. Say hi to her. Yeah, she and uh, her Ruth. sister are really tight with that. So, all right. See you then. Sounds good. Thank you again for this. Song. You're welcome. God bless. So, yeah. So, um, you know, I don't really feel like Jeremiah does, but I don't say anything. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I just can't, I I just keep quiet if somebody's doing something that's wrong. I, you know, or maybe they need to hear about the gospel. I tend not to say anything. I tend not to confront people. Yes. Yeah, I yeah I think that's one of the benefits of, of Paul. Paul is is so learned. He's he's. When you think of how Paul was brought up, how he was moving up the ranks in the Sanhedrin, how he was learning under Gamaliel, who was mm -hmm. the, the principal teacher at that time. He was, he was considered one of the greatest uh, rabbis, one of the greatest teachers in that day. And Paul's learning from him. And so Paul, he, he has all this head knowledge, and yet he's experienced everything as well. He, he has experienced a lot of the same things that that. Jeremiah is going through. And Paul, he has this one expression that always is a good leading expression. It's like, do you not know? You know, he, he's, he's, he's mm -hmm. taking it as saying, as giving the person the benefit of the doubt that perhaps you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think for many times, that's how sin works, is that is that it's this little encroachment. It's this little weakening. And it's like, well, okay, it's it's not, it's not it's something that I can handle. I'm not worried about it. Jesus has forgiven me. And, and sometimes it, things get out of control and we don't realize it. And we, we think that, that we're, we're fine, we're doing God's will. And it, it turns out that we need to hear Paul's words. It says, do you not know? Hmm. You know, I, I think of uh, in Corinth, in Paul's day, when you think of how Paul is talking to the people and how worldly they were, Corinth is, is a lot like Las Vegas or New Orleans, a very worldly, worldly city where, they, where the Greeks were worshiping all these different gods. And Paul is, is helping the church. He's, he's there telling the Gentiles who don't know what it means to be free, who don't know what it means to live under Christ. They don't know that they don't have to go and sacrifice to these pagan idols. They don't know that they should settle their matters, their differences between one another before they go to court. Paul is, is teaching the church. He teaches us, and, and I think, uh, as my mentor always told me, he always says he looks for that teaching moment, that moment, every moment where we're in God's word is always a teachable moment. Instead of coming down on, on somebody um, 
It's it's more like let me let me teach you a better way. Let me teach you about what God says. Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we forget. Uh, sometimes it's worse than that. Sometimes it, it's a it's a belligerent view, and we see that it, it's gotten to the point where the, the priests in the temple are calling Jeremiah a liar. They're calling Jeremiah is one who's, who's saying lies about God, who's misrepresenting God himself. The people are not going to go into exile. They don't want to hear that. But it's it's the words of Jeremiah has come to the point where sometimes God's word has to be used like a hammer. The law comes down like a hammer to 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 break impenitent hearts, to bring people to repentance. That is always the desire. God's desires for all people to be saved, even, even the people in Judah, even the priests, he wants them to be saved. But when people act arrogantly and out of pride, we see the things that happen, like Pushur, who treats Jeremiah badly. And even in these times, Jeremiah himself did not expect this type of treatment. Now, the other prophets did not receive this other type of treatment. And so Jeremiah is, is looking to God and it's like, I don't understand what's going on. Why are they doing this? I'm being faithful to you. And yet, look at what they've done to me. Mm-hmm. Just like, Lord, you... you... The only news you have for me to tell these people is bad news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I there's got bad news and I got worse news. <laughs> yes. Yes, but there, there's more than than you know that, that that news that they're going off into exile. Mm-hmm. They're going off into exile so that they can learn what it means to be God's people again. It's not for their destruction. It is, it is for their benefit so that they can learn, so that, that they be, can become God's people again, to worship God in the way that he had desired, that they would put away their false gods, that they would be able to, to be, have that freedom again. And Jeremiah is is struggling. He he says that he feels like the Lord has deceived him. And he says, You're stronger and you're going to prevail. You know, he's become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. How often do we see Christians being mocked because of because of our faith? How often do we see people and there are people who will tell you that if you're a Christian, that you're weak-minded, that, that you that you need help, that that you believe in fairy tales and myths. How can you how can you believe in this? It, it's worse than that, I think. I yeah. mean, there are people who will say if, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, you're actually standing in the way of progress of humanity. And you know, you're 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 the problem, not the solution. You're part of the problem, not the solution. You know, people yeah. like uh, Bill Meyer and that, the very uh, yeah. belligerent. That's not, like I used to be an atheist and I thought, well, you know, Christians were nice people, you know, generally speaking, like moral or something, but they were just wrong. So I didn't have an, a view that they were uh, evil. Mm-hmm. Let's face it, you know, that's what that's what a lot of uh, enemies of Christianity are saying, that Christianity is actually evil and causing problems far greater than any potential help it offers. When you think, yeah, when you think of where the world is these days, um, you think of how... Th- how this country, um, I mean, even with our founding fathers, many of them were deists. They didn't right. believe in Jesus. Right, they didn't. But they believed in the Almighty God. Right. And and they believed in the Ten Commandments. They believed, they believed that, that following God was a good thing. Right. 
Yeah, Fr Benjamin Franklin, who wasn't a Christian, said something like he thought that anybody who was an atheist was an idiot. You know, he was clear that there must have been a, there must be a God, not necessarily, yeah. you know, not not the God of the Bible, so to speak, or not Jesus, but there he was clear that there must be a God. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what's progress? Um, you know, what I have to tell you, one of the things we talked about yesterday uh, in our men's Bible study that happened to pop up talking about world things is, is the number one leading killer of the population in this world is surprisingly, it's abortion. Oh. Abortion is the number one killer in the world to try and limit population growth. Hmm. You know, people in this country, they see abortion as, as birth control. They don't see it as, as killing a person. Yeah. It's, and even to a certain extent with, with, our, with our aged population, uh, our aged population, we, we see a lot of them going into senior homes, which, which, which offer some great things. Mm -hmm. But the danger is that now, when they're removed from that family setting, grandparents have a lot to offer, not only to their children, but also to their grandchildren as well. How the stories of, of how they grew up, how life was so much different. We live in a world today that, that's that's full of affluence. That for the average person, they don't see a need for a savior. They they feel that God has blessed them. Look at all the stuff that they have. Wealth is a measurement of success. Wealth is a is a, a measurement of status. And and so now we hear the talk of leaving a legacy in their name. That's how they're going to be remembered. And people donate large amounts of money so that they can have a hospital wing named after them, for example. Mm -hmm. um, people, people aren't worried about what happens to the soul, which, which, is, which is something that's conditioned because when God created man, Man was created to live eternally. And even in the corruptness of sin, man still has that desire to live in eternity. And they just don't know how to make that. It's a condition, something that's conditioned that, that once you die, that, that's it. There is no more. That's something that's taught to people. And the sad reality is that people who do not believe in Jesus Christ are going to receive God's final judgment. That's the sad reality. It's not, it's not like Jeremiah in his day where judgment comes upon God's people to bring about a repentance to, to, for his people to repent of their sins to become his people again. And not only that, he gives the words of, of hope to Jeremiah. He gives the, the words of hope that a Messiah is going to come. Where, where is that? That must be a different verse. It's right? a different verse, yes. Yeah, we, we see how, how he's tormented, how Jeremiah is tormented, like in verse 10. I hear many whispering, denounce him. Let us denounce him. He hears his friends. His friends are watching for him to fall. And they're hoping that he's going to be deceived. And they want to overcome him and take revenge. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. How often do we think of the Lord as a warrior? Armed for battle. Which is how Jesus comes. When he enters this earth. He's here to take back that which is his. It's a fight. It's a battle. 
He is that warrior who fights for you. He fights for us. The Lord is going to make the persecutor stumble. He's going to, he's going to prevail. He's, he's that citadel. He's that fortress. He's that rock that the psalmist talks about. That he is our strength. He's our portion. He's our refuge. You think of all the different words in the Psalms of how the psalmist writes how God protects his people. And he talks about the people, these people who are not going to overcome. They're going to be greatly shamed and they will not succeed in their ways. They're, they're not going to succeed in keeping Babylon from coming out. They're going to die. They're going to die in battle. And it's going to happen within Jeremiah's lifetime. And so in, it, in, in Jeremiah's struggle, of course, he calls out, he says, O Lord of hosts. He's calling out to God, Yahweh. He says, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for you have I committed my cause. <clears throat> now, sometimes we, there are people, no matter what you say, whatever, what you do, that are never going to, they're never going to believe. They they have oh, their right. hearts that are that are right. stone. Oh, absolutely right. Yeah, there is nothing you can invite them. They can hear the word. It's it's like that parable of the sword that Jesus talks about with that word, that seed that falls on the path on the path, the stony path, where Satan comes and snatches up that seed. And it's not God's will that these people should perish. You know, people bring that upon themselves. That that is the work that they that they do. So they bring that upon themselves. They bring judgment upon themselves because of what they have done and what they have not done. <clears throat> and and that's a sad. It's a sad, sad situation. It's sad. When people, when parents lose children and they have doubts about the resurrection, they have doubts about what happens after death. You mean the parents or the children? I've seen it with parents. More that have doubts about yeah. the resurrection of the children. Yeah. The, the children are, maybe, maybe the children are believers but the parents are like well I'm not sure this is means anything yeah 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 and, and that's where we as Christians we have this hope and it's it's more than just a hope that's what faith is all about it is is being able to believe to trust in that which is unseen. Yeah, while the world thinks that Jesus is dead, that he never rose again from the dead, the empty tomb is the proof of Jesus' resurrection. The guards who were there to guard the tomb were witnesses to their resurrection. Matthew even records of how the guards who were guarding this tomb went to the, to the Sanhedrin and said, okay, what are we to do now? It wasn't our fault. He, he just got up and, and left. More than that, he broke out of his tomb. There was this earthquake. He burst. Burst to life. And Jesus guarantees that for us. 
There's many theories about what's what happened to Jesus, but none of the theories pan out. Mm-hmm. None of the theories. Disciples could not have stolen the body. These are Roman guards. These guards are, are out to do what they're what they're, they're told to do. Yeah, they're trained killers. They're trained exactly. Yeah. So the disciples didn't take the body. No. Jesus. Oh, he fainted. Well, no, we know he was dead because we heard of this guard who pierced Jesus' side with a sword and blood and water came out. Mm -hmm. I mean, these Roman guards, when when they execute somebody, they know how to do it. They do their job and they do it well. They're very very efficient. They're very very experienced. They are. I mean, it's not like, oh, well, I did that 30 years ago. Right. (laughs) It was like, I did that yesterday. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but Jesus was mortally wounded. How he even managed to, to, to get past the scourging and go to the cross. Mm-hmm. And how he with a loud voice as it is finished is paid in full. That's the final word. Paid in full. And this is this is the hope that Jeremiah has, and even in the midst of all this terror, this trouble, and everyone's against him, the Lord is there to do battle for him. The Lord sees his heart and sees his mind, and he's the one who's going to bring justice. And he says, he sing to the Lord, praise the Lord. Now these are the words, very words of Jeremiah. That even in the midst of all this, he can praise his Lord and his Savior, his Redeemer. And he says, he's delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. And sometimes that's hard to picture. Sometimes... Being delivered, to have your life delivered is not exactly what we may think. I I don't, uh, maybe, you, well, yeah, probably most of you would recall uh, the events of 9-11 back in. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly do. Yeah. Back in 2001. And. My wife and I, we we had planned a, a trip out to New England uh, at the end of September. And the big question is, is do we fly or do we not fly? And my wife and I were talking about it. We're talking about it. And I, I'll never forget this because it was the Sunday before our trip. And in, and in church, I'm sitting there and, and the gospel reading was from Hebrews. And in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, he talks about that God is my helper for what can man do to me? And I realized that even if we go on that plane, the worst that man could do to me is he he could kill me. That plane Mm -hmm. may blow up, Mm -hmm. but I'm still in God's hands. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm still delivered. And so we went on our trip. And that's the kind of confidence that God gives us in our word, in his words. You know, even though deliverance may be something other than we, than we pick or we choose or something that we want, God knows how to deliver his people. He knows how to save his people. He knows how to use his people for the good and benefit of his kingdom. You know, Jeremiah at that time, he's still struggling. He's still struggling when he's, He's talking about, he wished he was never born. <coughs> yeah, sometimes delivery is messy. Like if you deliver a baby, that's a mess. That's yeah. a messy process. And yeah. It's not always like uh, nice and neat, like Amazon drops a package on your, uh, on your porch. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, life, life is messy. Sin is messy.
Uh, sorry, sorry, we don't have the two-way interaction. I would, I would love, to, I would love that. But maybe we can do that work on that yeah. next week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell Jonathan not to turn off the uh, sound, and then hopefully uh, the winners will be here too. Yeah. So. Yeah. So were these people, the Jews of this time, of Jeremiah's time, were they, were they saying the, uh, in the morning, were they saying, Hear, O Israel, your God is one? You know, the Shema? Shema? Yeah. Yes. Were they saying that? Oh, yes. But then they were going and worshiping Baals in the afternoon? Sure. We can go back to chapter 7. I um, mean, one it doesn't include... God and Baal. If, if Baal is like any kind of God, then there's got to be more than one. So it seems kind of hypocritical for them to say that. It, it was. And, and, and that's the problem. Um, it, it's no different today. There's a lot of people who, who come to worship and think that their very act of being in worship is what mm -hmm. saves them. Mm hmm. And they go back out and, and they think that grace is, is, you know, grace is not receiving that which you deserve. And so, and Paul's even dealing with this, even in today's message, grace is, is, is all about receiving that which you don't deserve. It's all about receiving the gifts mm -hmm. of God. But it doesn't give us a license to go out and sin. Right. And, that, and that's, what, that's what the people in Paul's day were doing. That's what the people in Jeremiah's day were doing. And that's what the people today do as Certainly. well. Certainly, yeah. Today, just... yeah. We, we we look at Jeremiah. If we go to Jeremiah chapter seven, and we'll start at verse one. He says, "The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord: Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. This is the temple." And proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words, with no avail, to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name and say, we are delivered. Only to go on doing all these abominations. As this house, which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Go now to my place that is in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. And now because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and when I spoke to you persistently, you did not listen. And when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name and in which you trust and to the place I gave to you and your fathers as I did to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight as I cast out all your kinsmen, all the offspring of Ephraim. This, this is what Jeremiah is, is sent to tell God's people. You now here's God's people, they're going, they're going to the temple and they're going there because they're, they're going through these motions of going through the rituals, the feasts, uh, uh, the sacrifice of, of the animals to to pay to pay for the sins to 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 atone for their sins the day of atonement that came once a year 
they were they were looking to do this to make God happy, but then to go on living their own sinful ways. Where does this expression, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, where does that come from? That seems like a, I mean, that's repeated uh, in a lot of different places in the Bible. Why would people say that? I mean, why would they, yeah, why would they? It's, it's repeated as a slogan of defiance. Oh. So in defiance, they're, they're, they're not changing their ways. They're not amending oh. their hearts. They're, they're not executing justice. They're not, they're not taking care of the needy. They're not taking care of the sojourners. They're not taking care of the outcasts. They're, they're, they're taking care of people like themselves. But that's okay because we have the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like, well, maybe we do break all the commandments, but we have the temple of the Lord. Right. No, it, it, it's like a Christian coming to church saying that they're a Christian living a, 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 an immoral life. Um, not following God's word, not following God's will, just leading a, 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 an immoral life, whatever that may be, and coming to worship here on Sunday with, with pious hearts and c- confessing their sins and receiving God's grace and saying, okay, well, God paid for that. He, Jesus paid for those sins. So I can go ahead and sin some more because he's already paid for them. Mm-hmm. That's not what Christianity is about. It's about that change of heart. It's about amending the heart. It's it's about how the Holy Spirit works in one's life. It's to take that love that was inwardly focused on ourselves and to readjust the antenna to be focused on other people. I think it was in 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 was in one of our songs that we sang today. We talked and we sang about. How how we should how we should may have been yeah I don't I'm sorry I don't remember it's in this part of the service where you heard about how we should be outwardly focused focused on our neighbor focused by loving hmm. loving God loving our neighbor maybe not a confession of sins come to think yeah, of. I that's where is. yes I think it was a confession. you know we confess we don't always do that. And it's not necessarily because we willfully decide that we don't want to do that. Sometimes it it, it happens because of the the heat of the moment. You think of like road rage. (laughs) Oh, I got cut off, so I you know I want to get even. Yeah. And so even today, you know, today is a much, I don't know if it's really any tougher than what it was back when I was growing up. I think of when we were growing up, I think of, and, and maybe many think of this as well, is, is that there seemed to be a lot more people who were churched, a lot more people who, who seemed to, yeah. to believe in God. And I'm going to say they probably believed in God. But when you start looking at the numbers of the population back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the, the amount of people who were Christians was basically about one third of the population. And I always thought it was, was much more than that because I was thinking, I grew up in a town that had 34,000 people. And there was probably about 10 churches in the area, which means that the average church would have about 3,400 people. Mm-hmm. And the church I went to, there was maybe four or 500 people. And the other churches About may have same. been smaller or larger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a few that might have been up to 1,000. But there was nobody that, that was hitting 3,400. Oh, I see. So, yeah. you know, there was that 
that delusion, I think, that, you know, that, that our vision was kind of clouded to think of how we grew up in these Christian communities. And today it's, it's a little bit more obvious. Um, it's not more obvious because people, um, people really make their, their feelings known in one way or another. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a hot topic. It's a hot point. Um, people don't want their space to be invaded with Christianity. They, they don't want to hear the, the good news. And yet we, as a church, we need to go out and proclaim the good news. <clears throat> In fact, one of the things that I'm going to be doing this week is um, at, at Emmanuel Palatine, which, which is my vicarage congregation, uh, it's also a congregation I currently belong to, uh, we're, we're doing a prayer walk this coming Wednesday um, evening at 6.30. And we're going out into the community to proclaim God's word and message of, of hope and peace and, and pray for unity and pray for, for the Holy Spirit to work and in, in, in work in our communities. Uh, because, because the whole problems that we're dealing with today comes down to one root cause, it's, that's sin. Sin is the problem. That's the problem. And that's that's... The result of the problem is, is the turmoil that we're seeing because of sin, because people don't want to get along with one another. People don't want to, to look at people who look different as being fellow human beings. That's, that's the sin of pride and arrogance. And it's... And, all, all the people who who participate in this in one way or another um, we all, we all have have the sin problem and it's very difficult for us as Christians when Paul talks about us being imitators of Christ to look at others to look at people who may even be what we call enemies to look at them with loving eyes the way Jesus looked at all humanity, to look at human beings who were once enemies of God, that he would die for his enemies, that he would die for us, that he would die and reclaim us to be one of his. That is the true love that Jesus shows. As Jesus says in John, he says that there's no greater love than this, that one lay down his life for another. That's what a friend does. Jesus calls us friends. He laid down his life for us. And that's the message that's, that's not being heard. And all the stuff that's going on is, is, is the fact that we are all sinners and we need to be forgiven. And we need to look at others the way that Jesus looks at us. You know, Jesus looked at his people. He, he saw his people as being like, like sheep without a shepherd. So... Uh... Yeah. Some so when we are supposed to love justice and mercy, we're supposed to love justice and mercy for our enemies as well as for ourselves. Yes. And I think that's somehow I think part of sin makes you want to not care about justice and mercy for the other different person. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like we want justice and mercy for, for us, ourselves. But not for this other person. If they get punished unduly, that's okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, it's like driving. It's like driving on the tollway and somebody passes you going 90. And then you see the state trooper coming up and pulling them over. And you say, thank God it's not me. And, and it's like, look, you got caught. And, and you, know, you think that's justice. Oh, sorry. But when it's you that gets pulled over, you're hoping for mercy. He won't give you a ticket. Just give you a warning. But you want the other guy to get that big ticket to maybe he'll, he'll get his license yanked. Mm -hmm. That's that's how that's how the world sees justice. Mm -hmm. Now we want we want that mercy for ourselves, but when it comes to somebody else, forget about it. That's that inward focus. It's that selfishness. Mm -hmm. And really. You know, we, we don't necessarily know why that other person was speeding. We don't know why they had to get to someplace in such a hurry. There yeah. may have been a valid reason. Yeah. It's not something that's crossed my mind when I see somebody speeding very much. At, at, you know, not, not 1% of the time does it cross my mind that they might have had a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so just some perspectives. So I know I know Jeremiah's message. A little, little tough today, a little tough to hear. Um but we see even in, in all the trouble that Jeremiah is going through, that the Lord is still there. He still fights for his people. He still gives us hope. He still gives us salvation. And he still delivers us from whatever troubles we're going through. And that's the good news, is that Jesus is there with you always. That's his promise to be with you, even until the end of the world, the end of the age. Mm -hmm. With a premise like that, what else do we need? Oh, faith to believe it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, should we close with prayer? Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time today. We, we thank you for, for being able to hear your word the word that, that goes out that convicts hearts, the law that convicts us of our sins, but also the gospel that tells us that our sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. We pray that as we go out into the world that you would protect us from Satan. We pray that you would guide us through your Holy Spirit to be about your will, to be about serving those who are in need, loving others, loving our neighbors, loving them more than we love ourselves, Lord, loving you more than we love ourselves, let us be the messengers of the good news that you have for others. We ask that you would bless us, keep us healthy and safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Vicar Bell. You're welcome. I'm going to turn. Bye, everyone. Bye.